Welcome, I'm Yi Hua, the host today of part five of the Niche and Hot Invest Tech 11 part series. For each part, we bring one incumbent C suite executive and two tech founders to compare their traditional and tech platforms, respectively, for investing. Today's program is focused on tech and transformation amidst the pandemic or hopefully endemic, which has reshaped the way we invest. We'll be hearing from some of the top names based in Singapore. Stay tuned. A self introduction here. My background is in investments in property, infrastructure, and tech across geographies. I did acquisitions of ESG projects for Semcorp Environmental, including their first in India. Based in Australia, China, and Japan for over 10 years, I invest and asset manage accumulated portfolio of 2 billion in private equity fund and read of Escort, another Tamasic Link company. On tech, I was a founding member of Far East organization, Venture Capital Arm. I'm one of the judges for Singapore FinTech Award 2019 and 2020, respectively. I was recognized as a leading female leader in FinTech, in the FinTech Charms last year as an expert in investment tech. I was also executive committee member of SFA, Singapore FinTech Association, whose membership grew five times to 1,000 members during my two-year tenure from 2019. Today, based in Singapore, I advise on expansion strategy as intermediaries for tech and property investments under NH expansion. I'm a registered real estate consultant in Singapore. Housekeeping, uh, before we get started, I have just a couple of housekeeping announcements to ensure you all enjoy the program. If you experience any issues with audio or video quality, try to refresh your browser or use the chat box for support from my co-organizer, Bridge Plus. You'll be able to submit questions throughout and we hope you do. Do include your name and company name so we can give you a shout out. Please engage with us on social media. We are having a conversation there as well. So join us using the hashtag niche and hot invest tech. So we are bringing you a one-to-one -one conversation with a leading venture capitalist, William Clijan from Cocoon Capital after the presentations by the two tech founders. Let me now introduce our two tech founders. Our first speaker is Jason Edwards, Venture Cap Insights, which is the only Southeast Asian platform with accurate fundraising data of startups. Jason is concurrently partner at January Capital, Southeast Asia, most data-driven venture capital firm. Prior to January Capital, he was a founding member in another VC fund, Gro Gro Quadro partner in international law firm and general counsel of a large PE fund. Our second speaker is John Sharp, Hatcher Plus, a data-driven VC firm. As chairman and CEO of cybersecurity pioneer, author term acquired in 2010, John co-authored three US patents and sold cybersecurity solutions to US Department of Commerce, NASA, Google, McAfee, Microsoft and Symantec as CTO of Hatcher Plus, Dot Dot, Herdable, and Todd River, John developed several tech platforms. He has implemented ESG solutions with director roles at trade finance provider ASYX and payment aggregator Mozito, and as chairman of Mina based financial service pioneer Tau. Audience, let's get started. Jason Edwards, Venture Cap Insights, please. Thank you. Um, my name is Jason Edwards, and I'm the partner, uh, a partner of a venture capital firm called Genry Capital, and also the founder of Venture Cap Insights. Venture Cap Insights provides, for the first time, information on valuations, cap tables, and financials for startups in Southeast Asia and other parts of the world. I built Venture Cap because before that, there was no way to get accurate, detailed information on funding. Other platforms like Crunchbase and Pitchfork web crawled the uh, crawled the, the web for data and had very inaccurate information and they didn't have the valuations, cap tables and financials. Showing you the platform now, you can see how it looks. On the left-hand side, you can see the names of the startups and there's thousands of companies in the platform. And then in the columns, you can see things like the date they're incorporated, the total amount of funding, even things like valuation, revenue, revenue growth and EBIT 
All of this information comes from regulatory filings. We connect to the government company registries and get every regulatory filing for practically every startup every day. So it's like a Bloomberg for the startup ecosystem. If you click on the companies, you can get very detailed information. <clears throat> Um, obviously describes what the companies do, names of the founders, directors, uh, contact information, and then you can see the valuation for every stage of the company's history, together with the share price, the amount of funds they've raised, historical revenue and EBIT, so you can see how well they're performing, and then the cap table. You can see every investor and shareholder with exactly how much they've invested, how many shares they own, and you can actually see it round by round as well. You can search for companies by what stage they've invested in or what sector you're looking for. There's more than 700 sectors covered, fintech, medtech, agtech, et cetera. And you can also use other filters such as the valuation of startups, funding, revenue, revenue growth. Um, you can also look at the investors in the startups and there's more than 10,000 listed because we capture everyone who's invested from the cap table. So if you wanna find every investor looking at a particular sector and a stage, now you can find them to see every investment they've done in this part of the world and get their contact information. Uh, with that, I'll hand it over to our next speaker. John Sharp, Hatcher Plus, please. Thanks, Jason. Um, my name is John Sharp. I'm the founder of Hatcher Plus. Uh, we started in Singapore as a traditional venture firm, um, Hatcher, back in 2013. Um, to date, we've made about 134, we've invested in about 134 companies. Um, if you could put up the slides, please, thanks. Um, so basically what we've decided to do is take information such as the information that uh, Jason provides and, uh, and use that to build funds and to build very large, very scalable um, funds. And by the way, we were investor number, uh, subscriber number one, I, I believe. Uh, it's a fabulous service and, and we'd certainly highly recommend it. Um, next slide, please. So I wanted to talk briefly about uh, four trends that we see going on in the world at the moment. And uh, one of the trends that we see is a couple of very large players, in fact, three really that I'd name, Tiger Global, SoftBank, and Andreas and Horowitz, have decided that they're going to embark on seed to IPO strategies. And once upon a time, we would introduce each other at, uh, at conferences, and I'd say I'm a seed investor, and someone else would say I'm a Series A investor. And it's our belief that that's kind of going away and that we're going to see a lot more money pouring into these seed to IPO approaches. And these are going to take the form of data-driven mega portfolios. At a certain size, you can't build a portfolio manually anymore. So the technology that Hatcher has developed is technology that enables you to build very, very large portfolios of, of venture-backed um, companies. The other two uh, things I'd quickly point out here is that uh, we're using AI-based deal scouting to enable investors to find deals, to find companies that they wish to invest in and ones that um, are likely to be things that they, they would want to invest in based on their history. And uh, obviously what we're talking about with, with Tiger and with SoftBank and with Andreas, and there's really a grab for pro rata rights. That's how we see it. Um, we believe a lot of these guys are going to create uh, large stakes in early stage companies, maybe even pre-seed companies, and then go on and continue to invest in those and build a large scale portfolio. Um, next slide, please. And we believe that the, really the companies that get this right, that have sufficient capital, like Tiger's putting a billion dollars here, Andreas is putting 400 million. Uh, we believe that if you combine that level of capital with AI-powered deal scouting and filtering, uh, with a global network of, of, um, of deal origination um, folks and with business process automation, you can get a lot done. And we think that that, that group or groups that we think they're going to pretty much own this industry um, if this trend continues. Um, just a, a quick couple of uh, words on what we, um, what we do with our technology. If you go to the next slide, please. Um, the data-driven mega portfolios is something that we started talking about three years ago. Uh, we've explored or we've uh, researched about 600,000 deals um, globally uh, over the course of uh, spanning 20 years. And we've built some portfolios on those that are, are really well understood by us. And we believe that investing in a large scale portfolio just simply drives better returns. You capture more unicorns, you capture more power curve effects. Next slide, please. Um, we also believe very strongly in the seed to IPO strategy. If you look here, these are the returns um, based on isolated by stage. And you can see very clearly that the early rounds offer spectacular returns. And this is quite in contrast to what a lot of investors believe that they think they should invest in later stage rounds because you know, the returns are as good and less risky. It's not true. If you invest in the first four rounds of a company, you're going to get better returns. And that's, I think, by the way, something that all of us invest in. <clears throat> 
pardon me, AI powered deal scouting. Um, this is something that we've spent an enormous amount of money developing. We've raised about $13 million in the last three years in venture capital ourselves as a venture capital firm. And we've put that into developing very sophisticated tools that other venture capitalists can use to filter their deal flow and decide what they want to invest in. Uh, last slide, please. And finally, I just want to talk about the pro rata rights waterfall that I mentioned just a couple of slides back. What we see happening out there is, is a scenario whereby groups like us, like Hatcher, will create very, very large scale portfolios and then hand the pro rata rights for investment to the investors in that fund. And so this is something that we are actively looking to enable. It's our way of doing a seed to Syria to IPO strategy, but enabling the investors in our funds to participate in the later rounds where they can put a lot of money to work. Thank you. We have here William Kajan from Cocoon Capital, representing the incumbent C-suite VIP speaker. Set up alongside Michael Blackley in 2016, Cocoon adopts a hands-on founder-first approach to early stage investing. Female Founders Mandarin Hours appears to be his pet project. It's a new initiative from Cocoon to empower female founders since becoming an angel investor in 2014, Will has invested in more than 24 companies, including Property Guru, which we all know, Ticket Media, and Referral Candy. Will, I, I'm going to ask you a few questions to warm up before the Q&A session for the panelists. Data suggests that the trend in global investor interest in both public and private tech companies has driven valuations to unprecedented levels. This has been partially motivated by the explosion of SPACs, US listed special purpose acquisition B companies. Real, what is your perspective on this as a VC fund investing in early stage growth? Are you happy with this exit vehicle to drive up valuations? Sure, sure. First of all, thanks for inviting me to this. <clears throat> Great to be here. Uh, you, you know, when, when you take a lot of risk, like, you know, uh, for example, Hatcher and, and Cocoon and everyone investing at Seed and, and you as well, Jason, uh, you're always looking for exits, right? Yeah. And, and the thing in a developing tech ecosystem like Southeast Asia is that it has been hard to find exits. Um, it's, it's much, much harder than, for example, in a much more developed system like Silicon Valley in, you know, UK, Europe, and so on. So, so the SPACs actually represent a super good way to get liquidity. Uh, it was extremely popular if you go back a few months. I think it's kind of fallen a bit in popularity right now, but it's basically a way to shortcut your way to, to, uh, to listing, right? To bypass the IPO. So, so I think it will come back and it, I think it will be with, with a bit more, probably with a bit more regulation, it could be a really good way because what happened in, what has happened in Asia is that uh, especially Southeast Asian stock exchanges haven't really been amazing in attracting tech IPOs. Uh, actually, it's kind of funny that a lot of companies in Southeast Asia go to ASX in Australia to list. It's absolutely weird, right? Nothing wrong with ASX, but why should the Southeast Asian firm from Malaysia list in Australia? So, so I think SPACs kind of in the, is, a way, is a way to correct that, and that's good for us. Okay. Closer to home, I understand you are early investor of homegrown property guru, which is going the specs route. Congratulations. I'm expecting a treat from you after your windfall. What are the circumstances for you then to invest in property guru? And what do you learn from this experience? Okay, so, so I started being an angel back in 2004. Um, property guru started actually in 20, 2007. So I, I, was, I was so lucky to introduce the two founders because I had the same idea at that time, but I didn't have you're looking so for competition as well. Yeah. yeah, no, so so they started it. And, and I, th I think when, when, when we invest in companies, uh, we are probably not so data-driven because we are more like venture capital 1.0, I guess, uh, while John is uh, 3.0. We, we are more the kind of old style, Silicon Valley style investors. Uh, we invest in really few companies. So what we found in, what I found in Proper Guru when I was my own investor kind of, was that the team was amazingly good. Mm -hmm. And the second thing was that they used a proven business model, right? Mm -hmm. So this was the early days of tech in Singapore. And we, we could already see yeah, that see. this model was extremely valuable in the US and Europe. Mm -hmm. So it was a pretty easy choice at that time, I have to mm -hmm. say, uh, getting to know the founders mm -hmm. and seeing the model. So what I learned from that is that um, it's really down to the people that are executing and, and driving this company forward. 
uh, okay. regardless of business model. I guess. Yeah, mm. the people matters, right? That's why yeah. I have good people, uh, giants in this seminar. The coming out segment is the Q and A session. We would like to invite the audience to ask questions via paper slips for James, who is here, and the rest, uh, or virtual chat box if you have not done so. What are the pros and cons for investors on both platforms? And what kinds of investors do you attract? John, you have a lot of passion of your tech platform. I remember you said you can single-handedly cover the whole entire one-hour session when we first met. You are therefore the best person to keep off this conversation on this. Yes, yeah, so I think the, the, the question is, you know, what kind of investor we could service um, on, yeah. on the platform? Um, and, so and, our platform's the... really geared to uh, people that are, are starting to invest in, in venture capital for the first time. I'd say that's really our primary um, focus. A lot of family offices now are looking to invest in startups. Um, we've logged about 210 steps that it takes to create a venture fund. Um, and that's just to get you to the point where you're doing your first investment. So it's a very sophisticated process. It's a very time consuming process. And what we've tried to do with the Hatcher Plus VAST platform, which stands for the Venture as a Service Technology Platform, is take a lot of the pain out of creating a venture fund and then running a venture fund and then finding deal flow. And, and these are the really, really big um, problem sets that most investors find. So we're, we're geared, I'd say, mostly towards family offices, uh, CVCs, and, and in particular, investors that are looking to create a portfolio of early stage companies that they can later then invest in larger chunks of money directly into that fund as a corporate VC or as, as or otherwise just as an institutional investor. So really, we're, we're trying to sort of run the gamut of investors and, and help them do what they do in a better way, just using technology and data. Jason, your focus is on accuracy of the data source. Are both of them, I understand, uh... Hatcher Plus is your customers. What about Cocoon? Are they your subscribers yet? Of and course, what's your of views? Course, of yeah, course okay. we are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the best platform out there. Collusion. You know. We're very fortunate to have both of these esteemed investors as our subscribers. So our subscribers include <clears throat> most of the VCs in Southeast Asia now, largest investors in the world like Warburg, Pinkers, KKR, Sequoia, GIC, Tomasek, right down to the very smaller investors like 500 startups and everything in between. And we now have angel investors coming onto the platform and the startups themselves. Okay. Will, do you see your mainstream fund being disrupted, display, uh, disrupted and displaced um, ironically by the tech sector? Because they have AI, they can do what you do? Yeah, that's a super interesting topic. Um, yeah, I had actually one investor who wanted to get into the fund and he said, your job will, is already replaced by AI, he told me. So, you know, I, I thought my job was the last one to re, re, be replaced by AI. And now uh, John obviously uh, thinks otherwise. Um, I, I think if you do, if you have a portfolio approach to, to investing, right, to go into the asset class, I think it makes a lot of sense to use AI. I think for, for a fund like us, we, we invest in five companies on average per year. And, and as I said, we follow the classic model where we basically spend a lot of time with the companies. Um, we are two partners. We do 2.5 companies each a year on average. <laughs> um, there's no way AI can be used there except perhaps to do scouting and to find candidates for companies. I can see that. And probably we can use more platforms and more strategies to discover companies. I think Jason has something to share on, on that side perhaps. But uh, I think that no, I, I can definitely see that. If, if it can replace a strategy like Cocoon is doing, I don't think so when it comes to actually finally selecting. It's very much based on face-to-face -face meetings, uh, ideally in person, and uh, basically getting to know the founders really, really well. I, I agree with part of that, you know, definitely what Will's saying. It's um, you've got to select the right founders because you've got to invest in people as a VC. But I think the, uh, the investing success comes down to two things. It's access and its selection. And I think data for me is what drives the access yeah. because it's going to give you a reach that nothing like um, what John's building at Hatcher could do otherwise because your network's only going to be so far. If you build a brand, you're only going to get so much of inbound, but using data, you're going to be able to reach out and cover so many more, but you still need to make the right selection. You've still got to uh, pick the right companies, even though you've got that access. Thanks for outlining your process behind the investment choice and before even I asked. So how does your venture cap change during COVID-19? 
some audience here could be private equity who are contemplating venture capital investing. Jason, you mentioned this migrating pool of investor trend. So you wear double hat as a VC and tech founder. So which means the best person to answer this question. Uh, three or four years ago, we saw <clears throat> very large investors like KKR and GIC and Tomasek coming in at Series E. And that was very common because they had to invest very large amounts of capital, typically $50 million or more. What we're seeing now uh, is very large investors, including investors like General Atlantic, they're coming in at Series B. They've come all the way up. And there's reasons for that. Um, firstly, if they wait to a, a later stage, the very um, exciting companies are oversubscribed and you can't come in and write a large check and say, I wanna get in, it's extremely competitive. So they're looking for ways to get in earlier to make sure they can actually get access. Um, secondly, what they're also doing is finding new ways to invest smaller amounts, even though they're very large asset allocators, they're reducing the amounts that they can invest so they can get into earlier rounds to secure access. So going from series E to series B is a huge step in about three years. John, anything you want to add on? I recall last year you mentioned you should get into the early stage. Now the competition is really hot for early stage. Yeah, well, I, I think Jason summed it up perfectly. It's all about access. Uh, I mean, if, if, if you want to put a large amount of money to work, it makes a lot of sense to get on the cap table at a point at which the company is at seed stage. Um, so, and, and by the way, I just want to point out that when it comes to AI, we're, we're, we're not, um, you know, I, I think the one analogy you could use is that what we're doing is basically mapping the fires. That doesn't mean there's, there's less of a need for firefighters. Um, yeah, we're using AI to, to help us all invest more intelligently. We're using data from Jason. So all three of us on stage here are connected. And, and I think what we're talking about here is just generally an improvement in, in, in using technology and, and data to augment the very people-driven process of, of, uh, of investing. But just to go back on, on the point Jason just made now, I think access is going to be currency in the coming years. You're either going to have access to the good deals or you're not. And that excess is going to define in large part the success of you as an investor. So the excess is, this is why everyone's going earlier. It's why people have such an interest in seed stage investing um, all of a sudden, because they realize if they don't get in at seed, they may not get in at series B. And, and this is going to be a, a, a trend that will just get more and more in that direction. I should be hanging out at Bridge Plus looking for early stage investors uh, from now on. Since all three of them are uh agree that early stage is the way to go. Okay, the next question. The valuation of Revolut uh, will raise questions regarding the ability of loss-making technology companies to be worth more than some of the listed, public listed uh, largest companies. Follow, for, following its latest funding round, Revolut might now have a higher price tag than 70% of the businesses listed in, in London's Financial Times Stocks Exchange 100 Index, FUSI. What is going on here? William, is it now more lucrative to place your bets in VC fund compared to the past when you started out? Uh, uh, yeah, that's hard to say. I, I, th I think there's definitely a tech bubble going on. Mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't be surprised if you see quite a bit of a correction within the next 24 months. Uh, some of these valuations are absolutely impossible to defend, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, on, on the other hand, for fintech, there's obviously a big revolution going on, right? And, mm -hmm. and you know, the bigger you get, the more likely you are to be one of the winners in the future. So there's a, it's a big game going on there. Um, I guess I agree to some extent that the seed stage is heating up, but I would say there are still absolutely really very few seed funds around. Also, I think that when larger investors want to go and do seed deals all of a sudden, I'm not sure how well equipped they are to actually do that in a manner that is optimal for the, the seed stage companies. I think in, in any case, it's a good, it's good news for, for you as, an, as the founder out there, right? First of all, it's a great time to start a new company in Southeast Asia. The, the other thing is that the more interest in the seed stage, the more choice you have as a founder to, to, to find the best investor for you. So that's, that's good news. We, we need much more seed money into Southeast Asia, right? To prepare companies. And we need much more mentors to come in because it's really difficult to run a seed stage company. Mm. They're um, aimless, right? Mm. A bit aimless. Okay, um, is, John, is your technology able to capture such risk of overvaluation of loss-making companies and alert your investors? Or is it tech 3.0 in the works for you? Yeah, I wouldn't say that's our primary focus. Um, you know, valuations have a way of figuring themselves out. Um, 
anyone that's ever seen the Silicon Valley TV series will understand that sometimes high valuations are, are not exactly what you want to be achieving on your second or third round. Um, so valuation is really something that the market figures out, and I don't see that as a, as a risk. What we're really trying to do is, is just simply lay a, a level the playing field, and I think uh, what Jason's doing um, uh, as, as well is simply trying to get more information out in the market. What we try and help investors do is find deals that, that, uh, that are more akin to what they would, uh, they've typically invested in in the past and help them understand whether those deals are overvalued or whether they're in the, uh, the right pocket. But let's understand that overvaluing a company is somewhat of a weapon that you can use as an investor. And uh, I wouldn't be surprised to see that coming more on stream in the coming years. We're seeing an overviewed stock market, overvalued stock market. I wouldn't be surprised to see people overvaluing companies in the seed space or in Series A just to get in and, and get their footprint in that company, um, because I think that's a, a weapon that people with a lot of capital can uh, can bring to bear. And it's it's worked pretty well for my old compatriot Rupert Murdoch to build a, a media empire around the world to go around and overpay for things. So I think that's a strategy that, that we should be um, on the lookout for. So I'm not worried about overvaluation. I, I think it's actually going to come around and be part of a, a weapon that we'll see people using in the future. I see. Is there any Q&A session questions from the audience? If not, I will go next. Um, yeah. What are the niche and hot sectors for VC investments in the coming one to two years? Jason? Um, I, I think we've actually seen COVID accelerate the digitization of e-commerce in most parts of the world, but particularly in Southeast Asia. So we're seeing companies that were on the brink of collapse that are now raising very large amounts of capital. Mm -hmm. For example, grocery deliveries in Indonesia. Mm -hmm. um, people are stopped, stopped going out and they're buying online. People who never bought online are buying everything from groceries to food to to cosmetics, um, and that's powering so many companies in so many different verticals. So I think that'll continue to see a rapid acceleration. Um, I think we're also going to continue to see uh, things that might be a trend. Um, obviously, in the crypto space, uh, you're going to see um, that expanding in different ways, not just different currencies, different use cases, payment uh, options being expanded, perhaps not in China, but certainly in other parts of the world. Um, so that's going to create a lot more offshoots in certain companies that are providing B2B sources for those companies as well. So those are two areas I think you're going to see a lot of acceleration in the next 12 to 18 months. John, what do you think? Um, yeah, I think COVID's uh, uh, quite in interesting, having quite an interesting effect. I, I agree with Jason that fintech companies are certainly uh, benefiting e-commerce companies, but also pharma companies, if you think about it. Um, uh, until quite recently, it would take you five to seven years to get a product on market as a, as a developer of a new vaccine or a new treatment. And now we've just seen something developed in the, over the course of less than a year that's in the arms of 4 billion people around the world. Um, so I think pharma is going to, the J-curve around pharma is going to change quite significantly um, going forward. The J-curve around fintech companies, we own a fintech company in Dubai. Um, it was having trouble getting regulatory approval into some countries. Now the regulatory approval is there as a result of COVID because people don't want, um, you know, people handling money. Um, so, yeah, I, I think there's, the COVID has had a, a real impact, uh, particularly in fintech, but also in, in pharma and health tech. Looks like they are successful based on pure luck from, from, from COVID, right? Otherwise, they might not be here today, you know? So Possibly luck plays so. a big part, you know, in business, right? So William, what do you think? Are they going to survive uh, I, after the cushy period is over? No, I, I think the world is going towards digitization anyway, right? So yeah. COVID was basically accelerating something that was already happening, mm -hmm. which is which is true. I, I think I think a lot of businesses are investing in ways to be more resilient. That basically that's what's going to happen, right? And you see that you know if you are an offline business, you also have an online arm, so that you are ready for perhaps not a lockdown. The same thing is probably going to stimulate a lot more industry 4.0 much more automation so we just invested in an amazing robotics company mm -hmm. um, that makes it easier to use robotics because we think that COVID is driving probably robotics into smaller companies that before had trouble using robotics because it was too complicated so so one of our companies is basically an enabling technology for uh, making anyone use robotics uh, a small bakery instead of only the big tesla super uh, you know plant for example so so that's one trend i think 
Uh, and I totally agree with Jason on cryptocurrencies. I think when you see, when, when uh, national currencies are going to go on the blockchain, I think you're gonna see an amazing revolution in terms of both the existing bigger uh, cryptocurrencies, but also in the adoption of tools that, that use them as opposed to normal uh, fiat money. Can I jump in to ask a question which I, I didn't prepare beforehand? What do you think about non-fungible tokens investing? It's something out of the, a bit out of scope, but it's good to, to have three gentlemen answer this briefly. Um, I think it's been around for hundreds of years. I mean, the Mona Lisa is a non-fungible token <laughs> right, at, at its core. You're talking about unique pieces of property that, that are on the blockchain. The blockchain, I think, is as Will just mentioned, is going to transform everything. It's not taken over auditors yet. It hasn't taken over um, every transaction yet, but it's going to. I think we all know that. And so non-fungible tokens, I think, are an excellent way of isolating something that is a unique piece of art or, 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 or a unique piece of content and, and a wonderful way of, uh, of, of you know, isolating that and making you uh, allow you to know that that's a real piece of property. Um, the same way that blockchain enables you to, to know that a transaction is a real transaction. Jason, what do you think? I don't you think I can say it any better than what John said, so I'm not going to add to that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, 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 think I, I say the same thing as John says, but obviously if you go and look at the valuations of some of those uh, you know, pieces of uh, GIF or JPEG, it's absolutely insane. So you, I, I guess you're not talking about the individual artworks here because oh, yeah, some of that is just completely out of reality. So don't spend all your money to buy you know, a digital yeah. picture. Just, just yet. Yeah, cartoons. Yeah. How traditional fund investing investments and investing via fintech channels enable high returns versus direct investing in tech companies? Because, because you, you, you know, there's this. You, you get. Can you repeat the question? We we have traditional fund investing, which is what we is doing. We have investing via fintech channels. Now, two tech founders are doing. How does it enable higher returns compared to? to me scouring around Bridge Plus to look for startups to invest my own money directly. So, so yeah. Maybe I'll start there, but I think the obvious one is when you're investing into startups, they do have a sort of higher risk, higher return. You do need a portfolio approach. So if you're scouring around looking for a startup, if you're just investing in one or two, it's probably hard to get that portfolio that's going to make that investment really work because if you're going to have a number of early stage investments that don't work out, it's not going to help you. But hopefully in a fund, uh, you're going to have enough of the companies that do sufficiently well to make the fund do well. John? I think at core, everyone takes a portfolio approach. Will's taking a portfolio approach. We're taking a portfolio approach. Um, I'll share a secret with the audience of something we've learned from our research. And that is that uh, roughly about one in every 100 um, seed stage investments goes on to become a unicorn um, and has that power curve effect in your portfolio. Um, so if you have a small portfolio, you need to put an awful lot more work into finding out what those companies are, which I'm, I'm sure Will does and, and his partners do. Um, what we do is we tend to take a broader portfolio approach and let the portfolio figure itself out. Um, so it's uh, the two approaches are, will reach the same end um, in that you, you will end up capturing some unicorns. So you'll end up capturing a property guru or, or, or something else in your, your portfolio. We've already got uh, just after 18 months to two years of investing, we've got a couple of, of really outstanding companies that are going, uh, going to the moon in our portfolio as well. So I, I think all approaches are, are valid so long as you put in the work on selecting the companies. And whether or not you do that manually by meeting with the founders or whether you augment that with AI, you need to end up in that same place. You need to have a portfolio approach so you can, you can grab a couple of those unicorns, those power curve effects and have them work for your portfolio. Because your portfolio is all about the top 5%. A 95% of companies are really not going to play a big role in your returns. That the, 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 the five companies that are in your 100 company portfolio are going to be a very, very big part of the returns that you you produce for your investors. That, that, that's where we disagree, right? Because I yeah. think in our portfolio, 70%, 70 percent, seven zero percent of companies uh, actually give us returns. So, so that's that's a fundamental difference. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm talking about the the statistically the industry yeah, over yeah, 20 yeah, years, I know. right? I know, so, I know, I know. So, so if you, but but I but I but I definitely agree. We both have portfolio approaches, and you have to have portfolio approach, right? You have to have at least ten to twenty investments uh, for this to make sense, unless you can look into the future, which is hard. Okay. 
We have a questions from the audience, uh, webinar audience. How much impact will the excessive cash circulating as a result of worldwide quantitative easing have on the venture and private equity space? It seems that we have some economists in our audience. So it's, it's, it's quite, quite- uh, um, Question about the removal of quantitative easing or increase of quantitative um, easing? Um, the easing of quantitative, easing of the easing. yeah, easing of on, the easing. yes, on private equity space, you cover private equity as well, right? Well, it's not going to make the, the capital is not going to go away, right? It's still going to be invested. Um, so I think what we've seen is an amazing amount of capital flow into venture capital um, in the course of the last few years. That slowed down a tiny bit last year, but I don't think it's going to, I think it's going to continue its trend. There's Michael Jackson, a, an influencer in venture capital that I, I follow. I think a lot of us follow on LinkedIn. Um, he interviewed someone this morning and said that they think private market investing is going to be, it can not just continue to be a trend, but it's going to rise um, as a trend in the, in the coming years. I completely agree with that. And that will be driven in part by the amount of quantitative easing that we've seen. So even if quantitizing, quantitative easing slows up, uh, I think we're still going to see a, a, a lot of the existing capital being channeled into, into venture capital investments. But what, what typically can happen as well is that at some point you will get the correction in the markets, right? Because the markets are extremely frothy just because people have been printing trillions of dollars, right? In the last few years, obviously, if they stop printing all that money, um, you will see correction. And that could actually lead to probably one of the most crazy markets being corrected more than other markets. And that's the tech market. So just be aware of that as well. But anyway, you know, we, we are... Right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The good news is that if you're in venture capital or if you're a startup, startups are generally super resist resilient against these kind of market corrections. And also venture capital, you know, we, we raise funds for the next 10 years. But for a company that want to go out and fundraise, I mean, probably the sentiment for some time might be negative. So you should always watch out for that. So, I mean, the rule is if someone is offering you good money for something, you should probably take it. Uh, well, and, and uh, yeah, another thing is that probably you since, I mean, Southeast Asia is a, it's a difficult place now because of COVID, right? COVID is hitting four or five of our countries really, really hard. So what we also say to our companies that you, they should, you should fund yourself for a longer time now than before. So probably 24 months instead of 18 months or 12 months, because you don't really know what's going to happen in the next 24 months. Will is a very cautious uh, venture capitalist. I can see from, from what you say, always be very careful, very careful about your cash flows and, and getting fundings uh, for your investing companies. Jason, you have anything to add? If not, I go to the last questions for today. I think uh, Will's very right to be cautious because uh, you're funding companies that uh, in their early life um, only have a runway of maybe 18 months or two years. And so at that point in time, they have to be able to attract uh, new investors and more money. And if things turn, uh, turn sour, turn ugly in the world, then people become much more risk averse. Um, there's risks that even if they do well, uh, it'll become more challenging to raise money. And so that's not going to be helpful for the, the companies we invest in and won't be helpful, helpful for our funds. So uh, I think right to be cautious uh, because we want to make sure that our companies uh, survive for the long term. Okay. Um, across me is MAS uh, building uh, where MAS is. We are at 79 Robinson Road. So I have a question about regulators and this will be broadcast. Um, how can Singapore regulators facilitate increased activity for venture capital investing? Jason, you again? <laughs> Uh, well, I think the MAS, uh, Singapore in general, has done uh, a great deal to um, really build a powerful ecosystem in Singapore by providing incentives both to startups, but also to investors like all of us to be here. Um, and those incentives, I think, have attracted a lot of funds. And there's more and more funds, there's more money, there's more startups. Um, and I think they've tried to provide a lot of other resources in the ecosystem. Um, yeah, some might question whether it's been put too much into certain areas. But I think just the incentives themselves and the framework that they've built has helped. What they could do, I think, where the challenge is, and it's a, it's a challenging one, is allowing more of the right skill sets to come in. Uh, and that's, of course, a balancing fact for any government because you need to weigh that up against a lot of other considerations. Because as you get more and more uh, uh, well, high, high growth startups, they need to get more and more people that are capably skilled. And what we're finding is the big tech companies are 
drawing out the higher skill sets for engineers and developers and making it quite challenging for the smaller stage companies to go in and be able to afford the high quality uh, people. So those are issues that I think we'll continue to see. <clears throat> bigger companies, bigger bank balances take people easier. Smaller companies need to be resourceful. And what they're doing is looking offshore. Um, so that's maybe not necessarily always ideal, but right now you're seeing a lot of uh, uh, jobs being pushed out to low cost jurisdictions. John? Um, I'd, I'd like to give a shout out to the MAS actually. I think the VCC is, um, is a pretty remarkable structure and, um, and, and they've done a, an extraordinary job of pulling together a structure that a lot of people seem to be lining up for at the moment and, and seeing as a very viable alternative to Luxembourg and Cayman. And uh, where we've developed technology that enables you to create a VCC in 24 hours. Um, we have all the templates and we have all the steps mapped out and, and programmed out now to a point where as a family office, you can very quickly get into that, uh, get your own VCC together. It's a fabulous vehicle. And I think that the, the, um, the MAS deserves a, a quite a lot of credit um, uh, for putting that together because that's going to be a huge asset for Singapore as it builds out its, its wealth base in the coming years. That's the global corporate uh, tax rate dampen VCC, do you think? Well, if you set your VCC up the right way, that, that won't really affect you, right? I mean, it, it, we're talking about investment income. And, and so I think there's ways that you can structure your, your holdings here that, uh, that like in Luxembourg or in the Caymans, you can, you can have a very, very good result. Um, so it really just comes down to working with your financial advisors and making sure that you, you, you're getting very good advice as to how you structure these things. I hope Beach Plus has a tax advisory firm uh, based here to cater to all the, all the fund in, funds uh, needs. Um, will, will, what do you think? No, I, I agree with everything both of them said. I think if MAS makes it even easier to start VC funds now, that's going to be uh, dangerous because it's already super easy to start a VC fund. Uh, so yeah, not, nothing to comment, but, but the, the lack of, or the trouble to find qualified people at a reasonable price, definitely the biggest problem we see, but that's probably not under MAS, that's more MOM. MOM. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and this is actually something it's a bit benefit to us because what we're doing is creating technology to, so that you can do more with less people. Um, so that's what VAST is about. So, so yeah, we're in part trying to put together technology to, to allow for the fact that there may be less staff available to all of these up and coming funds in, in the future. And this is going to be a pressure that we all face. It doesn't matter where we are in the world. You know, finding qualified staff that can work at a family office is going to become more and more difficult. Yeah. So, so we, we, our regulators, we need help from MAS, from Ministry of Finance, as well as Ministry of Manpower for, for fintech startup to grow and for fintech fundings to, to grow in this region with Singapore as a regional HQ, isn't it? So with that, we have reached the end of the part five of the talk series. We look forward to you to join us for our future niche and hot invest tech talk series at Bridge Plus, 79 Robinson Road. Thank you for being such an engaged audience in person or virtually. Please continue to engage with us via niche and hot invest tech hashtag. And we love to have hear from you and see you for the rest of the 11 part series. Please take a moment to rate the speakers, the moderator, and the technical and space support from Bridge Plus. Goodbye. I didn't tell the panelists.